Okay, so, um, all right, so the next topic is constraint space, okay? So, um, <clears throat> you remember uh, this uh, example where I introduced the concept of freedom space, um, and, you know, it's this, it's this crazy parallel system with wi three wires that are going in kooky angles and everything, and we found that the freedom space is these two uh, disks that are rotated 90 degrees that share this common red rotation line and they represent all the ways this is, you know, if those were ideal constraints, um, you know, that couldn't stretch along their axis or compress, but they, they were infinitely compliant in all other directions, then, then this, this stage could rotate around any red line with no resistance, you know, infinite compliance, and uh, it would be infinitely stiff in all other directions if I tried to rotate around any other red line that's not in this freedom space. Okay, and the way we found it was we, we, drew all the, we drew the three original blue lines and then we found all the red lines intersect all the blue lines, okay? Okay, but, and, and so what we did is, you know, we got rid of all the stage and the ground and everything. We just drew the blue lines and we, then we drew those red lines, okay? So, but, but here's a huge realization that's really profound and super obvious too, um, is, is that, um, you know, if all the red lines intersect all the blue lines somewhere at least once, then of course all the blue lines need to intersect all the red lines at least once. And so a big leap in thinking is to say, okay, well, if you found all the red lines intersect all the blue lines somewhere at least once, which is manifest in those two disks, have you found all the blue lines? You know, we, we just had original three blue lines, and we found all the red lines, and there's an infinite number of red lines, but are there more blue lines that we didn't draw in this picture that intersect all of those infinite red lines within the disk somewhere at least once that aren't drawn on there? And the answer is yes. There's actually many more blue lines than those original three from the wires. Okay, for instance, every single blue line in this disk on that plane, the vertical plane, um, every single blue line there intersects every one of these red lines at that point. Okay. And since they're on the same plane as the other red disk, they will, every single red line in both those, or every single blue and red line in both those planes, because they're on the same plane, will intersect in finite space or be parallel intersected at infinity. Okay, so stare at that for a while and convince yourself, yes, all those blue lines will intersect all the red lines in both those uh, disks. Okay, well, are there any other blue lines? And that, of course, contains uh, this blue, this vertical blue line. Are there other blue lines? Well, what about every blue line in that disk? Okay, every blue line in that disk will intersect every red line in that disk at this point, and they're on the same plane as these, so it'll, be, it'll intersect or be parallel to all those. So those all work, and, and of course this disk contains those two original blue lines. Okay, so turns out every single blue line that could possibly ever intersect uh, all of those infinite red lines in both those red disks somewhere at least once are contained in those blue disks. You'll never find any other blue line anywhere uh, that will, will satisfy the condition of the rule of compromise patterns. Okay, okay. so now we've found a new geometric shape, except this one is filled with blue lines that lie within intersecting disks. Okay, but what's the significance of it? Okay, well, let, let's put it back on the mechanism, get rid of the red disks. Okay, those are the new blue disks we found. Well, of course, those blue disks contain the original three blue lines. That's the point. This all came from those. You found all the red lines intersected those and found all the blue lines intersected those. So, of course, they contain the original three. Um, but what would happen if we now selected other wire flexure constraints and aligned them with their axes with the other blue lines in those disks? Like, for instance, what if we drew constraints C1, C2, and C3? So, I'll show that again. Say I drew those, okay? Those are, those are other wires that would lie within that, uh, that space of those blue disks. And what would they do? If, if I add those to that system, would I change the system's kinematics? Would, would it change the degrees of freedom? Well, the answer is no, because all those blue lines, the new blue lines I added, C1, C2, and C3, would still all intersect the same red lines of the freedom space, of course because they lied within the blue constraint lines uh, that all intersected all the red you know, lines in there, right? So, so, 
you know, of course these original three intersect them, but any other wire I pick from this space of blue intersecting lines, or the, the, these blue disks, um, will of course always intersect all these red lines, will achieve the exact same degrees of freedom and freedom space. And so basically, the significance of that blue space is that it tells you all the ways you can pick constraints so that they are redundant. Okay, so this is obviously an over-constrained system. It, you know, by adding those three new constraints, if I had added any one of those or any combination of those, it would just, you know, it wouldn't change the freedom space at all. And by definition, that makes them redundant. And by definition, then that makes it so that they're over-constraining the system. So this new space, which is blue, it's populated by blue uh, lines, constraint lines, is called the constraint space, and it represents... Um, every constraint topology or every wire flexure configuration um, that beyond the original three would over constrain uh, the system and 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 you could just keep adding them within that space and uh, you know it won't change the degrees of freedom at all it'll just stiffen it increase the load capacity do all the things that over constraint does um, with, without changing the degrees of freedom okay Okay, so, um, okay, so, so just by giving you this picture, I show you in infinite different ways you could constrain a system so that it achieves the freedom space that we wanted, th those interlocking red disks. Okay, so every, so, so here's the thing. Um, if you want to move like this with all these permissible motions or some combination of those, right, then all your designs will lie in this space, this constraint space. Like you don't need to brainstorm, uh, you know, interesting designs. You know that all the designs that are parallel that will work have to lie within this space if you're going to achieve that motion. And if you want to achieve that motion, all the designs have to lie in this. So your designs are going to look like these, you know, spokes coming out of these, these disks with wires, and then they'll achieve that, that freedom space. So there, there's, there's essentially a one-to-one -one mapping. And this is what's so powerful. If you go from blue to red, you're analyzing. If you go from red to blue, you're going to be designing. Okay? Um, okay, and, and, uh, and here's the thing. According to Maxwell's equation, here's how it works. Remember, there's three independent red lines in here. So the number of degrees of freedom is three. Remember, two from each disk, except they're sharing one. And so it's, there's, there's three independent red rotation twists in there. Okay? And so six minus three, you can also swap this, right? And, and that, that'll tell you there's three non-redundant constraint lines in there. And by the way, these blue constraint lines are pure force wrench vectors, okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about why intuitively that's the case or, you know, how you can reason that that, that would be the case. But, but the bottom line is, is every single one of these blue lines can be modeled as wrench vectors where the Q value is zero. They're, they're pure force wrench vectors. And in the same token, uh, three of them in this space are independent. You know that because Maxwell's always right. Six minus the number of non-redundant constraint lines. Again, there's three. You know there's three because remember we went back to this. We, we began, th this system was exactly constrained. Remember with these three wires, which means they're all non-redundant. They're all independent. Okay, and then all the other ones beyond that over-constrained it. Okay, so, so you know there's three independent ones in this space. And again, it doesn't matter what color it is. There's two independent ones in this disk two independent ones in this disk, but because they share the same line, there's three in the whole space. So six minus three is three. Okay? Okay, so now you know what a freedom space is. It represents all the, all the, you know, you tell me what degrees of freedom you want, and I'll tell you every possible permissible motion that will come as a combination of those. It tells you all the ways the system could move. And then it's complementary one-to-one -one mapping constraint space, okay, um, tells you the design space where all the wire flexures need to be placed to achieve that motion. And, and you can know from this equation, if you know how many 
degrees of freedom are in here, you, six minus the number of degrees of freedom equals the number of constraints, you know how many constraints you need to pick within this design space uh, so that it's exactly constrained. And then any more above that will just be over constrained. Okay? So, and, and again, you know, there, there's no other, this one to one mapping is, is, is critical to, to realize. Like, there's no other, you know, it, there's only one unique constraint space that maps to one unique freedom space. It goes both ways here. You know, it's not like there could be another constraint space that maps to this freedom space, and there's not like another freedom space that can map to this. And it's because of the rule of complement patterns. The, all the lines in both have to intersect them all somewhere at least once. Okay? Okay. So, maybe it's not clear how you design or analyze just yet, okay? Well, we've already been doing analysis, right? I give you a mechanism, you draw the blue lines, and you find all the red lines that intersect them. That's analysis. You now know how it moves, okay? Now we're going to start getting into design where I give you red lines, I give you what you want, what motions and degrees of freedom you want, and you're going to start designing stuff, okay? So let, let's do this exercise here, which is the first direction toward being able to design, okay? So, what you want to do is... Find, so this is a freedom space we're all familiar with. It's the disk, right, of red rotation lines. You know, there's two independent things in it. Find the freedom space complementary constraint space, okay? And the way you do that is you want to identify all the constraint lines that intersect every freedom line at least once. Then determine how many non-redundant constraint lines are in the constraint space that you need to select. So, so first of all, let's find the constraint space, okay? So what you want to do, if this is the freedom space, you want to find every blue line that intersects all these infinite red lines somewhere at least once. Okay, so I want you to kind of put, put me on pause and I want you to think about that yourself. Can you find geometric shapes that start forming around every blue line? Okay? All right, I'm assuming you did that. Um, I'm going to tell you the answer. So what the most obvious shape that people come up with first is think of every blue line that intersects that point. If, if there's any blue line that I draw that intersects that point, then it's going to intersect all those red lines at that point, because they all intersect that point, right? And what geometric shape would make that? Well, basically kind of a, a sphere or a starburst of, of blue lines coming out in every direction that are contained within a sphere, okay? Kind of like rays from the sun, okay? That would be one uh, kind of shape, okay? Well, can, can, are there other blue lines that intersect all these red lines somewhere at least once that don't just intersect that point? you know, in all directions, not just in a disk, but in a sphere. Are there other ones? Well, there are. Say I draw a blue line on this plane, like at some weird angle here. Well, just by virtue of it being on the same plane as this disk, it's going to intersect all those red lines, but be parallel to one of them. And therefore, it intersects that one in infinity. So, that, yes, that'll work. So, basically, any blue line on this whole plane, I could draw it anywhere. It doesn't just have to intersect there. You could draw any blue line, fill this whole plane blue um, with any blue line, and it will intersect all those red lines somewhere at least once. Okay? So if you draw this freedom space constraint space, it looks like this. Okay? So here's your sphere of blue lines. Again, I can't draw every blue line, but I draw enough to show you it's a sphere. Okay? And that, you know, it's important that that point corresponds with that point. And then... Um, and then this blue plane. Now, now, you'll notice up to this point when I draw freedom spaces and constraint spaces, if there's black curves or lines, they're just geometric identifiers. They're not twists, they're not rotations, they're not wrenches, they're not anything. Okay? It's just, since, since this disk, I can't draw it infinitely large, I bound it with this finite black circle. Right? And I, I draw this black plane to show it's just on the plane. Okay? It's, there's no significance to it other than it's just geometry. Okay? But if I highlight, it, you know, notice that this isn't, these aren't black lines. If that was black lines, I'd just be saying that's a plane, but nothing special about it. The fact that I highlight it with thick blue means this whole plane is filled in with blue lines. Okay? I could have just colored this whole plane blue, but then you wouldn't have been able to see through it and everything. So, so my convention is if I highlight the shape blue, then it's totally filled in. And again, these are black because it's like the sphere or the circle. Those aren't twists, wrenches, or anything. Those are just geometric identifiers, okay? So, so the first shape we found was this sphere. second shape we found was this filled in blue plane. And those are blue lines in any direction that lie on that plane and fill it in all blue, okay? Okay, and, and again, I draw them separated by this arrow. Okay, this double-sided arrow, just because I don't want to draw them on top of each other, it's a visual mess. 
but just know it's, it's critical that that point corresponds with that point and this plane corresponds with that plane. They, they, can, they should be thought of as being on top of each other and oriented in very specific ways because they're linked together. Remember, all the red lines need to intersect all the blue lines somewhere at least once and vice versa. So they're always on top of each other and locked together in a very specific configuration. But when I draw freedom and constraint spaces, I, I separate them by this arrow and I, I, you know, I separate them and it should be clear what's locked on top of what. Okay? Okay, so this freedom space you know has two independent degrees of freedom in it. You know a disk has two things that are independent in it. Okay, well, therefore, from Maxwell's equation, how many independent things are in this constraint space total, right? There's a kind of two subspaces, and there's the filled in plane, and there's the sphere. And maybe at this point you don't know how many are in each of those separately. Um, and, and we'll get to those. You, you'll learn that. But, but you can already know how many independent things are in the entire space, okay? Because 6 minus 2, you know this is 2, is 4. So you'd have to pick four things within there, okay? Um, so, so already if you're designing, if, if I say I want something that moves with this freedom space, so I want a tip and a tilt, two intersecting rotations, then you would know, okay, then you're going to get this freedom space and you know all the possible parallel designs have to lie within its unique constraint space that this maps to. And if you want it to be exactly constrained, you're going to pick four. Okay? So, so I hope you see how, where this is going. This is truly getting to the fact design approach, the freedom and constraint topologies, the freedom and constraint topologies approach, uh, you know, maps from degrees of freedom to freedom spaces to constraint spaces, and then you know, it tells you how many independent things you have to pick to be exactly constrained. Then anything above four will be just over constrained. If you, if you so desire to over constrain it, great. But the cool thing is, it's just in one glance, uh, once you know the constraint space, you can visualize every possible design has to lie within this space. And it guides your creativity and makes it so you don't have to brainstorm infinity you know like you're you're honed in on like every design lies in that space and you better pick four to be exactly constrained if you care about precision okay so that's that's a little exercise there so let, let's do another exercise um, to get more familiar with constraint spaces okay so you want to find this freedom spaces complementary constraint space by identifying all the constraint lines that intersect every freedom line at least once okay so you remember this freedom space has three independent things in it it's just a box of all parallel red lines and perpendicular translation arrows that are perp you know, perpendicular to the direction, you know, perpendicular to the axes of the red lines, right? Okay. Okay, so can you find every single blue line that intersects every single one of these red lines, including the hoops? Okay, in, in other words, so, so um, Remember, there's two ways you can think of you know, constraint satisfying translations. Um, you can either think of them intersecting the red, the red lines at infinity of their hoops, or you can think of them being what are the lines that are perpendicular to the translations. Okay, so, um, well, the answer is every single blue line in the same box that points in the same direction that's parallel to every single red line works. Because every single one of these blue lines will intersect all of these red lines at infinity, and there'll be one line that's collinear with it intersects it all along its entire length, right? So every single one of these will satisfy the rule of complement patterns for every single red line, and all of these will intersect those hoops of the beach ball, obviously. Okay, they'll, they'll intersect them up at infinity that way and down at infinity that way. The the corn the tops of the beach ball when they spin, right? And um, and they're all obviously perpendicular to the directions of the translations, okay? And remember, they're drawn separate, but you've you got to think of them on top of each other. Just think of tons of parallel blue lines in there, and that's, that's how you want to think of it, okay? Okay, so that's the constraint space. That's the complete constraint space uh, for this freedom space. Um, so how many independent things would you have to pick in there? Well, you know, there's three independent things here. R equals three, okay? So six minus three is three. Okay, so you're starting, hopefully you're starting to memorize, it, you know, whether it's red or blue, uh, if it's a box, there's three independent things in there, okay? So both for this one and for that one. 
Okay. All right. Um, all right. And by the way, this is the constraint space. Actually, I don't know if we're going to get to, to that one, but that's the, this is the constraint space of this one, right? With the uh, the four parallel lines, right? Remember, th going back in that example, this was this guy's freedom space, and you can surely see that these four original blue lines in here lied within this box of the constraint space, which is why it achieved this freedom space. And given that there's only three that are independent, you know right off the bat that one of these is redundant. You could take it away and it would still have the same freedom space. Okay, so let's do another exercise, okay? So what you want to do is find the complementary constraint space of this system's freedom space using the rule of complementary patterns, okay? And then determine how many non-redundant constraint lines lie within the constraint space then confirm that the system's four wire flexures lie within the constraint space found, okay? So st step one is let's use the rule of complementary patterns to find the constraint space of this system's freedom space, okay? So remember, this was one of our examples we built. This was, uh, yeah, this, this one right here, right, uh, that we built. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's got these, these rotations you know, on this plane and they're angled in the same direction as that, right? So, but... Let's just find the constraint space of it first, okay? So find every single blue line that intersects every single red line somewhere at least once and, it, and it is perpendicular to this translation arrow and therefore will intersect that hoop at infinity, okay? Well, uh, okay, well think about it. What about every, what if I draw a blue line on this plane? See, note that I've indicated it with black lines. Those are not red lines or blue lines. Those are just black lines. It's just showing there's a plane. And this is not a filled in red plane. This is just a red plane of, this is a plane of parallel red lines. So it's different than a filled in plane, okay? And uh, so, so anyway, but, but it's, okay, say we draw a blue line on that plane, okay? Will it intersect every single one of these red lines? Yes, it will. And will it be parallel to this guy? Yes, it will. And will it eventually intersect that guy? Yes, it will. Okay, no matter how we orient that blue line on this plane, if we, if we make it parallel to it, it'll intersect them all, right? If we don't make it parallel to it, it'll obviously intersect them all. So every single blue line on that same plane would work. In that case, that's a fi filled in blue plane. I'd highlight this all blue, and I, I could just color this all blue, but I, I don't because it, 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 it looks like a mess. So I just highlight this, uh, the outside blue. That, that's one of the shapes of the constraint space. What's the other shape? Are there any other blue lines that don't lie on that plane that will satisfy these conditions? Well, sure. So, so first of all, he here, is, here is that blue plane. See how I've highlighted this blue plane? thick blue lines, it, just imagine it all filled in. That plane has got to be coplanar to this plane, okay? But the other shape is this box of blue lines, of parallel blue lines. Do you see how every single parallel blue line in there will be parallel to all of these red lines and will therefore intersect them in infinity? And they're all going to be perpendicular to that black arrow, so that'll satisfy that. And, you know, you can think of them as all on parallel planes, parallel to this, that will all intersect this hoop at infinity. So you can see it works, okay? All right, so that is the complete constraint space. It contains a filled in, uh, right, a plane of all blue lines and a box of parallel blue lines, okay? And, and these, this plane, if you think of it on top of each other, this plane is coplanar to that. And this box better have blue lines pointing parallel to those two. So that's how it's located and oriented with respect to that, okay? And you know, we, are, we memorized and proved that this is, there's two independent things in there. Therefore, how many independent things in this constraint space? Well, 6 minus 2 is 4, so we need to pick 4, okay? And how many independent things can be just in the box itself? 3. There can only be 3, remember? Okay? Um, and so, so anyway, you're... 
anyway, I don't want to confuse you too much now, but this entire space with the box and the plane needs four to be picked. But you can't pick all four from the box because boxes only hold three. After that, it's redundant, right? Okay, so you'd have to pick one from the plane that's not parallel. But, but anyway, th th that gets into a future topic. But just uh, for now, just know that is the constraint space. And to, have, to exactly constrain something, you need to pick four things from that constraint space. Okay, so let's, let's uh, go back and see. L let's lay that constraint space on top of this original mechanism. So the way this, this freedom space was located and oriented is this is on that plane and they're oriented you know, parallel to those two wires and the translation's coming perpendicular like that. So let's arrange the, bo the, the constraint space similarly and you'll see that highlighted thick blue plane of all blue lines corresponds with this plane and the box is just all blue lines that are parallel to these guys. And, and again, I constrain the box to be on the mechanism but it's infinitely large just like the plane, okay? And hopefully you can see by now that the original four wires all lie within this. These two vertical ones lie on that thick, you know, that plane, that blue plane, and these two angled wires lie in the box. Okay, so indeed we picked four from the total constraint space, two from the plane, and two from the box, and um, they're all independent and they all work. Okay. <coughs> Okay, so now let's, um, let's do the math of, con so we, we, we introduced what freedom space was and it gave you a bunch of qualitative uh, kind of practical examples and then we did all the crazy math to show how it relates to twist vectors and independence of twist vectors and these kind of things. Now, then I showed you constraint spaces and showed you all the practical uh, nice qualitative things with that and now we're going to do the math of constraint spaces, okay, which is not a whole lot different um, but it uses wrenches instead of twists, okay? So, okay, if you have a wire flexure, okay, then, then what that wire flexure does is, remember, it's, it's basically you model it as an ideal constraint from constraint-based design. You say it's infinitely stiff along its axis, um, and, but it's infinitely compliant in all the other five degrees of freedom. So it kills the translation here, uh, but allows these five degrees of freedom with no, it, it can't resist those. So a way to model that using a wrench vector, okay, remember this is, the, this is the wrench vector equation, is to model, say, well obviously this, this wire can't impart a torque or a coupled torque, so Q is zero, so you get rid of this, and it simplifies to this, um, but what a, an ideal constraint does is it resists with a force along its axis. It can impart a resistive constraining force along its axis, clearly, a pure force. Uh, stopping it from stretching or compressing. That's a pure force along its axis. But then it can't impart any forces in any of the other directions. Okay? Just along this blue line. So that's why when you have an ideal constraint, um, you know, you, you, uh, you can model it as a pure force, zero Q, wrench vector that can only impart forces along its axis to resist motions along its axis but is totally incapable of imparting forces in other directions, which is exactly what a pure force wrench vector does. Okay? So that's, that's the link between um, wire flexures and pure force wrench vectors. Okay? And if you have a coordinate system out here, you draw the location vector to it, F there, Q is zero. Okay? Okay, so, all right, so, say I have uh, say, and I could give this to you an exam. Say I have these, I have this coordinate system X, Y, and Z, and I draw these pure force wrench vectors, these blue lines that, you know, these guys, this corresponds with X and Y. This is one meter and one meter up over in Y and one meter up in Z. And this is one meter back in Y and one meter up in Z. So you've got four pure force wrench vectors, and it's like, okay, let's, if we linearly combine those with different force magnitudes, um, allow the force magnitudes of all those four things to be any finite real number, um, what space would it populate? What, what, what constraint space would it generate? Okay? Well, you already, you know, I'm telling you, there's the answer. Okay? If you linearly combine these four, you'll get this. But how could you know that mathematically? So I, I might just give you on an exam this chart on the left here and say, draw the constraint space just from that. 
Okay? Of course, one way you could do it is you could find all the red lines that intersect all those blue lines somewhere at least once, and then find all the blue lines that intersect all the red lines 